ما و تاجر میگی آماد دست پای مرا بمو کاش که دست ما مرا کاش که دانی و متاخ مرندا و مرا کاش که بین و تاخ مرندا هم با چی که دست پای مرا باست که ما کو چی هم زد ی چی که دانی مرا ما کم کری از اولی تو دفع دار خوردم کی مرد که مرا کرد که دست سعی میکنم کلان آهی نس اینه مقاوی نس ماماش گفت دادوانه تو شاشا کنم تو کسی پاشه را چرا دواره خوردی؟ چرا بر ما نگفتی؟ و گفتم بومرو من بومرو نمرو من بومرو چی بکاره سی دنیا بر ما؟ This is the story of countless women stuck in a justice system run by men, prejudiced by culture and tradition. My father is a man who 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 is a man Understand something Socrates said, you must name it. Let's name the story you just saw and all the global injustices against women, gender apartheid. I chose the word apartheid for two reasons. The first reason is that violence against women is the most common, most pervasive human rights abuse on the planet. And secondly, because it's seemingly impossible to end it. But we all know apartheid can end, even when it's impossible. And it takes a while, which it will in Afghanistan, the worst place on earth to be born a woman. It has the lowest literacy rate for women and the highest maternal death rate one in seven women die giving birth. And under Sharia law, two men can verbally accuse a woman of a crime, say, adultery, or leaving the house without permission, and she is deemed guilty and an outcast, as are her children. The lucky ones, like the women in the film, like Gulnaz, who refused to marry her rapist, the lucky perpetrators of these moral crimes are sent to prison. And the alternative is being stoned to death. I'm a journalist and a humanitarian filmmaker, which means I travel to exotic places, which will never host a Club Med, to tell the stories of people who have no opportunity to speak for themselves. More often than not, I'm relating the suffering of the most disenfranchised, the women and children, in places, war zones like South Sudan, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we know so many more. The job is a barbed gift. My work chips away at the invisible inequities of life. But the news is mostly bad, and the latitudes simply change. So why bother? That's the second question people usually ask me. The first one is, can you introduce me to the Dalai Lama? I'll get to him in a minute. But first, I'm going to admit something really embarrassing. Doing a TED Talk has been on my bucket list for years. <laughs> <laughs> and I've often imagined myself on this stage, pretending I'm really intelligent, and at the same time trying to logically explain why I'm a perversely lucky journalist who gets to forego pantyhose and at the same time piss off the Taliban. Now, I'm not a serious person, as you can tell, but my work is very serious. In fact, je suis Charlie, as are you, even if you don't know it. Evolutionary biologists say, say that external stress is the only factor that causes an organism to change and adapt to a new life. And humans 
we're the most powerful force on the planet. And that includes all of us, right? Now I'm looking out here, I can see people thinking, oh, I am not an activist. I don't know how to start. I don't know where, where to go. How long is this woman going to talk? And I feel like that too sometimes, especially because working in a refugee camp, every day is like Groundhog Day. It just goes on and on. But the difference is that I experienced a life-changing epiphany in the produce department of my local grocery store. I know how to change the world, even if it's impossible, and it will take a very long time. It happened six years ago. I had just returned from my fourth trip to Afghanistan, where I was covering the, an exclusive access story to the $100 million Taliban detention center at Bagram Air Force Base. My crew and I had toured the facility, observed the 24-hour cameras on the Quran to make sure that there were no US military transgressions. I'd seen the hot pot pies, the state-of-the-art medical and exercise facilities, and I was impressed. But I was really confused when the commanding officer said to me, we're turning this prison over to the Afghans in here. Uh, but how do they run their prisons now? And, and why would we give them the keys to all these high-priority Taliban prisoners? And the general, which I bet you all remember, G General David Petraeus, that brilliant military strategist and incredible public servant who had one moment's bad judgment with a war zone journalist, not Ma, <laughs> he, he assured me that political negotiations and training had been taken care of. So stay with me here. We're going around this Afghan corner to the, to, to the produce department. <laughs> so I'm walking to the helicopter. Blackhawks rides are part of the perks of war zone journalists. And one of the prison guards whispers to me, you should see the women's prisons. Now, for a woman who cultivates dangerous enthusiasms, this guy was my Afghan deep throat. <laughs> so I say to my reluctant driver, uh, I'm going to give you 100 bucks, And we negotiated the IED-laden dirt road 30 miles to the nearest women's prison, which was in Parwan. Afghanistan has 32 provinces, 32 women's prisons. Got there, gave the prison director 100 bucks. No problem, I'm in. It used to be, when I first started going to Afghanistan six months after shock and awe, you could give Karzai 100 bucks and get in there. Now it takes like several suitcases of 100 bucks, and he's not even president anymore. So we're, I get inside. There's snow on the ground outside, and inside, in one concrete room, are 38 women, 18 children, with no heat. And Golnaz, the woman in the, in the film had just given birth a week earlier to her baby daughter on the floor without a doctor in attendance. I had to promise my driver a new windshield, but we stayed for seven hours and got their stories. And they were incredible. I went back home, CNN, NBC, they were vying for the exclusive access footage to the $100 million Taliban facility, but no media outlet, no magazine, no newspaper, no TV, would run the Afghan women's story. I offered it for free. I pitched it for seven months. The standard rejection was people have compassion fatigue. They don't want to hear about Afghanistan, about these poor women. There's nothing they can do. So I became disheartened. I became disgusted. I decided I was going to change my career to knitting. And then finally, this very brave, Editor-in-chief of Marie Claire magazine broke ranks and said, I'm going to bust this story out. I just can't stand it anymore. And so that was October 2011. And I'm headed to the produce department. <laughs> Things are good. Plenty of organic choices. You know, their story's coming out. They're going to do huge spread. The only problem is that the designer, Tom Ford, did not have time to make really cool t-shirts. The magazine was going to sell so we could help these women and children. And so his problem became my problem. Because I knew for the first time in my life, 12 years career, that, that my article was not really going to be able to help these women who were locked in Afghan prisons. And this was a painful admission. So I thought, well, I already do so much, way more than other people. Why does it have to be me? 
Why can't someone else step up? I went so far as to compare myself. I'm sure Nelson Mandela has felt the same. <laughs> this, is, this is where we're going to go. And that's when a woman walked up and accusingly pointed at the arugula and said, can you believe they're charging $11 a pound and it's wilted? I stare at her. And then I began to sob like a crazy woman. I get it. I cannot change the world. It's impossible. But what I realize, even if I, I bet I can do this. I'm a journalist. <laughs> and so what I realized was that I can write truthful, genuine stories that can change people's minds. And they can take action. And then the world would change even if it's impossible, and it will take a while. So armed with this revelation, I decided I had to know why some people stepped up all the time, you know who you are, and some people, well, they just wanted arugula. So, for example, ask yourself, why is it after you tried desperately not to meet the eyes of the homeless guy who's standing on the corner with that cardboard sign that says, well, work for food, but prefer not to, do you finally fish some money out of your pocket or not? Why do we give? I asked myself this, and I came up with really good reasons. I give because I can alleviate the problems, or at least try to. I give because I'm a good person if I do. I give because I'm an absolute slime ball if I'm drinking a double caramel macchiato that costs five bucks, and I don't give to that guy. Or maybe I just need a tax write-off. Well, whatever the reason, if we examine the motivation behind our giving, no matter how worthy the cause, the silent noun is always I. In the end, you might be forced into child marriage, but if I give some money, we both get to feel better. So giving, in the conventional sense, is motivated by our own needs when we're honest, not theirs. And this explains why giving to others often feels more like an obligation than an inspiration. OK, so in 1943, the psychologist Abraham Maslow studied human motivation. And he created a chart called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. I applied this motivational chart to giving. According to Maslow, humans share universal needs that motivate us to take certain actions. First, there are the deficiency needs, which are driven by survival and lack. 98% of the entire world lives on less than $2 a day, and they live in the lower four, most of them in the first two levels of these deficiency needs. So, if your child is dying of starvation or lack of clean drinking water, you are not going to be thinking about your neighbor's problems nor arugula. OK, and then when these needs are met, we raise up to the cognitive needs. And, but if you look at this chart, even at the highest levels of self-fulfillment, self-actualization, mastery, say Sam Walton's net worth, our motivations are still driven by needs. And so we evolved Westerners, that's us, we humans that are up in the top three categories. We're very needy Barney Five characters that are driven now but what, by what we think we need. More power, more money, more knowledge, more sex, a better job, a better spouse, a better world at least until you get to transcendence, according to Maslow. And that's where the Dalai Lama resides, I'm pretty sure, because he personally told me that compassion is black and white, and that I needed to be as forgiving of George Bush as I was of the Iraqi children. Now, I was pretty sure this was a lifetime assignment. <laughs> and then he went on to say that W is also the American president that has done the most for the Tibetan refugees. And guess which former first lady is the biggest champion of human rights for Afghan women? Laura Bush. So back to the 
department, dragging the needs chart in there. And here's what I realized. I was motivated, dra driven, passionate, risked my life to help other people because it made me feel good. In fact, the deal was it was like my drug of choice. And, and this is why our good intentions are often misguided. We are serving our own needs before the needs of those we serve. Hear it again. We are serving our own needs before the needs of those we serve, which is why 600 billion in international aid is impotent. We all need food and water and, and rest. And some of us think we need fresh arugula. This personal transparency into my own needs allowed me to see how, what other people need and how the world can change. I can't, I can't change the world, but I can tell the truth. I have a tiny pedestal that keeps me off the street corner yelling, the, the end is coming. And, and in those articles or in those films, I can say, I can invite you to change your mind, to see the world as it truly is and as it can be. And then you can do what you can do, and then the world will change even if it's impossible and it takes a while. I know this because I went home from the produce department and posted a plea on Facebook, and I needed some help to design a t-shirt because Marie Claire would run it in the magazine. I had 24 hours at a Boise-based company that designed the very cool Not Guilty t-shirt, one in the magazine's article, and we sold $25,000 with within two months, which we then donated and got literacy teachers and school supplies in 11 of those 32 prisons. I started the Afghan Women's Justice Project to keep this program afloat. Now, AWJP is still alive and well. It's tiny. We have a website. We, we are volunteers that ship these t-shirts out of my garage, but we still fund the literacy teachers and the kids' school supplies. We even bought a van for the kids. Now, 130,000 people have signed our petition to end gender apartheid and stop imprisonment for moral crimes without due process. And our stories in Marie Claire created a groundswell of international press that forward, forced President Karzai to grant amnesty to Golnaz and her daughter, and they're free today. And for me, I've stopped complaining about arugula, although I never did. And I've also stopped giving. And I invite you to do the same. Instead, do something, do anything, but nothing for someone else. It'll change their world. It'll change your world. And eventually, the world will change, even if it's impossible. Thank you.